so far what we've got here where I've left off is I've got the the input fields and these buttons and such and so I'm able to I cleared my I cleared my console and I'm going to add another class class 575 and this is uh, Spanish with instructor uh, Juarez let's say so I'm going to add a class and then my console tells me okay I added a new object that usual stuff and then down here it tells me class added great so I'm obviously means I'm seeing the not error part of the code remember our code here we have those two results we either have an error or the positive result and we did it backwards just to think about it in a different way not error if there's no error that means it's a positive result or else there is an error so it's a negative result now if you test a little bit more, because testing is important, you might discover something. Watch this. Let's say I leave this as CRN575, but then this is Spanish2 with instructor uh, Alvarez. I'm going to add another class. Click Add Class. Error. It's telling me I some kind of error over on my console. Um, it looks like it worked in the console, but I'm getting a result on screen from the part of my code that is else. There is some kind of error that happened. So um, I'll explain what happened in a moment, but for fun we could also do this. If we go back to our code line 28, there's a line that appears when there's an error. We simply said the word error. But that data, that actual error, is coming from this variable error, and the positive result is coming from that variable called result, that parameter actually. So just to see what's happening, what I'm gonna do at the end of line 28, before the uh, before the end of the line with that semicolon, I'm gonna add the plus and then space and then error. No quotes here because I want to display what's in that placeholder, error. I want to display it on screen. I'm going to make it say the word error and that error. And it's going to look kind of weird and ugly, so actually I'm going to add, uh, in here I'm going to add a break. Because I can write valid HTML here. So I'm going to say, it's going to say error, it's going to have a break, and then on the next line it's going to write whatever error this is kicking back to me. This is built-in stuff. How do I know this? It's built in. I read the documentation. It says that you have the result of either positive or negative. And these things can be called anything. We're calling them error and result. I could call them bad and good. So then it would be error plus bad. Let's see what happens there. So I'm causing this error to happen because I'm trying to use the same CRN. So if this was Spanish 3 with instructor Smith at class, I'm also still getting an error. Now it didn't output the error on screen, but that's okay. Uh, because I'm going to show you that we're getting this error, that it's not letting me add to the database exactly how I think, because of the conflicting because of the conflict the ID. Remember I said that every class that we create here needs these three fields or has these three fields. But what it needs is an ID field. Every pouch DB object needs an ID field. And it has to be unique unless we're using it for the purposes of updating an existing record, which is a different can of worms. But what's happening here is I'm trying to add another document uh, to the screen uh, to the database that has the same ID. Well, let's back up and do something here. Let's go to our web browser. I'm in Chrome as I'm recommending, and up on the on the top here, if if it's hidden, um, you know we've got console, we've got all of these other things we can look at, such as elements, and it shows our HTML. Uh, but let's look at uh, resources, resources tab, 
This is where you would look at what cookies your web browser has saved. Local storage, that sounds familiar. Local storage is what we've used a little bit previously to save the person's name when they've added it to our app. And then we've got web SQL and indexed DB. Behind the scenes at the lowest level, PouchDB is using something called indexed DB, which is one of the two standards that are currently competing to be the standard for web databases. And so here, on my resources, it says I've got an index DB data. And I know simply because there's a little triangle here. If there's no triangle next to something, it means there's no data saved in that, in that method. Uh, so if you open up that index DB, pouch underscore SDCE classes, that's the name that we created early on in the project. It's prefaced with pouch, and it's whatever we call it. If you click on it, it gives you a little bit of information about itself. Yours may be different than mine, especially the integer version. Don't worry if that's different. Then further opening the, the, the particular pouch database, if you open that, then it's got basically different ways to, to look at the data. Um, if we look at, for example, by sequence, click on by sequence. Now we're actually looking at the database data. In my case, there are three uh, objects. Yours may have more or less, depending how much you've played with this. But I've got key 1, 2, and 3 on position 0, number 0, number 1, and number 2. And then there's the data, title, instructor, something called doc ID revision. If you click to open that, you also see some other information. And so this is the actual database. We're looking at the, what's in my database. This currently has three, um, three, um, three, three objects, three records, three documents. And each document has various fields. Um, is one way to look at it. We can also, um, let's see, we can also look at it by document store. This is another way to look at it. That might make some sense. Document store. So the zeroth item, the first item, the second item. This is the key or the ID, the class number, the one that is unique. There's already a 123 class, a 575 class, a 777 class. And what's inside of that, if you open these, uh, some other stuff. There's the idea again, the sequence. So different ways to look at this data. So by default, if you try to add another uh, document that has the exact same ID, you'll get an error. Um, if we want to update an existing one, we have a different method for that. We'll get to that later. What I'm showing you here is this is the place where we can actually see the database pouch SDCE classes we can go in and look at the different objects that we've added to the database the different records we can even um, select those things and down at the bottom I would not do this just yet but down at the bottom we can clear that we can delete that from the memory this is very much like um, local storage in that local storage saves permanently whereas a variable deletes as soon as you close the browser. So if I closed, I'm going to close all my browser completely. You don't have to do this. But I'm going to close my browser completely, and I'm going to reopen it. And then I'm going to open the console. I won't put anything in yet. Open the console. Go over to Resources, Index DB. It still remembers SDCE classes. I'm going to then go over to By Sequence. My data is still there. This is a lot like local storage in that it's permanent and it's being saved technically to the web browser. On a lower level it is somewhere hidden in your hard drive, but technically think about it that it's saved to this web browser. So that means that if I open If I open uh, this in Firefox and I open up the console, 
which is different than Chrome. If I open up the console, not the console, but the uh, debug tools, and then I have to activate somewhere here. It's not active by default. Uh, one of these things. Um, I always forget where it's at, but I, you have to turn it on somewhere. I would be able to look also at uh, the database that it's stored, and the point that I'm getting at is that that data that I saved is not going to appear in Firefox. I opened it, I opened the, that HTML file in Chrome, it saved itself in Chrome. It didn't save itself in a file that can be accessed by every web browser. It saved itself to Chrome. So if I, if I was able to open it here in Firefox, I would show you that the index DB would be empty because I have not saved anything to this <coughs> database in Firefox. So taking it further, eventually we're, we're going to add this to our app, and so that means that it's going to be saved to the person's device. And using the other powers of Pouch, then we could then uh, replicate it or save it elsewhere. Um, that's getting ahead of ourselves. So. I know that Firefox has a way to view this stuff. I'm not quite finding it. I think we've got an older version of Firefox, so just trust me. If I were to open this up in Firefox, it would not show that data because I've saved the data in Chrome only, not in Firefox. But this is why we would uh, have uh, the results of, uh, of if or else. Um, it's not showing the exact error here, but if I put it in the console, it might. In any event, let's move on here because we've added data to the database. forgot to refresh. But anyway, um, yes. So I'm trying to add another class also called 575. I get the error and then I get that which is not very uh, user friendly to show to the user but here it's telling me uh, status 409 name conflict message document update conflict. So it's basically saying okay are you trying to update the current document because you didn't do it right or are you trying to add a document that's already been added to the database? Because you're not doing that right either. Okay, so what I want to do is after I add to... One of the ways to try to help minimize that kind of error is after I... Um, after a person adds a class, I then want to clear the fields. There's many ways to do it, of course, but uh, here's one way that we'll do it because we'll, we'll do it via a function, which then we can reuse. Um, so here, let's go outside of the add classes function, which in my case is line 34. This is not going to be attached to the add classes function anymore. We're going to define a brand new function. Function. We'll call it clear fields. This is going to clear the fields and other things that we might want, like later on when we get it into Cordova, we could also make it vibrate, for example, or play a sound or something. That's why we're doing it as a function, because a function can have multiple commands in one. Simply at the moment, what I want to do within the clear fields function is document dot get element by ID and I'm gonna get the whole form itself which is called class form and that has a method called um, reset This is a method called reset, and what it does is it resets the form. 
So I've defined a function called clear fields. And I want to call that function like when, uh, when I successfully add a record to the database. So I'm going to say up on line 27, clear fields. So if there's no error on screen, it will say class added, and then it will clear the fields. So that someone doesn't accidentally click the add button again and try to fill the database with the exact same uh, data. So if we save and run that, I'm going to add, um, I've already got a class, well, I'm going to do one here first. So class 888, uh, title ABC, and instructor, blah, blah. Add class, class was added, fields were cleared. So subtly different than, than before, but now not only did it add to the database, but then it cleared the fields. If I'm forcing... I know I've got a class 888. I don't have the functionality yet, functionality yet to update the classes. I'm just trying to show you this possible error. I'm trying to add the exact same class again and I get and I have it write the word error but then I also simplified this to say document update conflict again that's more for the us the developer I wouldn't really show that error to the user but the trick that I did here was I had error dot message and I know it's dot message because when I ex when I showed that error a moment ago it had a, a result that said I think it said uh, code colon something and then message equals something so I'm pulling that message to show on screen, like this. If you just have it say error, it's going to say status is 409, name is conflict, message is that message. So I can access, I can say show me what's in the message. Show me the message instead of this whole thing. So we have status, name, and message. So here I said error.message or error.status, which will be totally worthless for the user. What is error for? What's 409? Formula 409? I don't know what this is. So error status dot message. Show me what message the error message is giving to me. Again, it's kind of wordy for a developer. I wouldn't really show that on screen. But I'm just showing you we could pull a little piece of information out of that longer error message with this dot notation. The object is an error object dot what is the field in the object. Well, if you're curious, you might say, well, what would happen if uh, we go back to class added plus result? And result is coming from up here. Something is being saved here, and we're displaying it there. So something is being saved here. Why not if we display that? So at the end of line uh, 26, just for fun, if you'd like, you don't have to. But I'm then going to say plus result. Well, actually, I'll put it on a new line. I'm going to add a class that doesn't exist class number that doesn't exist. Add class. Oh, not that interesting. Class added, object, object.
So obviously I could look this up in the pouch documentation for it to tell me exactly what I can do with it. I'm going to take that out for the moment. That was just for testing. But anyway, we've added stuff to the database. We've got that simple clear field. Um, what I want to do is I want to show the classes on screen. I want to, um, as, I've, as I've been adding all of these classes, I can see it in the, in the console, but the regular user will not see it. I want to sh click Show Classes and show those classes on screen in a nice little table, for example. So let's proceed with that. First, before we forget, let's go back down to line um, 48. Line 46 was our button to add the class running a function add classes. Line 48 is a button to show classes, so we're going to add an on click show classes. Let's go to line 48 at the end on click. We'll tell it to run a function called show classes, which doesn't exist yet, of course. We will create it ourselves. I'm going to back up uh, right before the end of script, so line 39. We'll write a new function, show classes. The purpose of this function is to retrieve the documents from the database. Uh, so I might have five documents, 50 documents. I want to retrieve all of the documents. I can, of course, uh, looking at the documentation, retrieve a certain amount or certain range or all this complexity. But for the moment, I just want to retrieve all documents from the database so that then I can show them on screen. The way we would do that is db.alldocs, open close parentheses, semicolon. I'm going to say, give me all the documents from the database. Well, I'll spit them out in a really ugly format. So I'm going to massage this a little bit to give me a little bit better results. And so there's a bunch of options that I'm actually going to say, and we kind of have to do it in this certain way just because it's PouchDB. But inside of the parentheses, actually, we want curly braces. and then a comma, and then enter to divide that. We'll see why in a moment. Because this is very similar to what we had up here, if you think about it. We had db.put, we had our first parameter, comma, and then the following. Well, very similar here, db.alldocs, the first parameter, comma, and then the function. But in this case, it's going to be multiple options at once that I'm giving it. So I put it in the curly braces. That's just the way PouchDB works. So sometimes the answers are, that's just the way it is, just like you tell your kids. And so here, uh, one of the first things I'm going to say, part of these options is, I'm going to say, this is built into PouchDB. I'm not making this up. I'm getting it from the documentation. Include docs colon true. I forget exactly what that means, but it's basically about giving me all the documents. Comma, space, ascending, colon, true. Give it to me in alphabetical order. Ascending, smallest to largest, or first letter to last letter. A through Z, 1 through 10. Because in this part right here, we could have said an option about which documents within a range within certain parameters. We're just saying, give me all the documents. Give them to me in alphabetical order, ascending. Letter A to Z, 1 to 9, all the docs. And because we're going to see this over and over, we have some sort of PouchDB command, the PouchDB method, and there could be a positive or a negative. 
fail or not fail. That's where this next part comes in here. Function. Callback. Yes, we can use the same name here because they're separated by functions. Whatever is in this function, which is uh, add classes, lives in its own world separate from the functions in this function. Show classes. So I'm going to call that function callback again. It has open close parentheses, open close curly brace. You're going to see the syntax the same over and over. And I can basically reuse what I've got up there, so I can also call this error, comma, result. So on the one hand, this could be confusing, and on the one hand, it could be useful because I'm calling it the exact same thing in two places. And a lot of times we learn you cannot reuse the exact same code unless there's certain circumstances like this. A function in a function separates itself from another function. All right, so actually I'm going to break that curly brace like that. And what this uh, function simply does is pulls the data out of the database to actually show it on screen in a nice format. We're going to write another function which takes each record and then displays it on screen in a nice format. So we're going to say here, um, just for expediency, we're then going to say show table of classes, open close parentheses we're going to run a function which we have not defined yet which will show a table of classes the classes that we're getting out of the result so actually then we're gonna say result dot rows each um, each one um, object one document is a row in the database So. Up here on show classes, all docs, I'm pulling the data out of the database. It's giving it to me in one long string, basically, and putting it in result. So then I'm going to define a function to show that in a nice way, row by row, basically. So let's save that. I'm going to make a note over here on line 45. Um, end of show classes function. On top over here? On the button of show classes, I added the show classes function, which is what we just defined right now. So now we have to define the function show table of classes. That's the function that's going to build this table <coughs> one row at a time. So just so that I don't misspell it, I'm going to double click that to copy it. And then on line 46, function, paste, open close parentheses, curly braces. And now here I'm going to define outside of the show classes function. Uh, I suppose I could do it inside of the show classes function, but uh, we'll do it like this. So show table of classes, make sure it's spelled exactly the same. So I copied it and pasted it. And the way this is set up is that uh, it's going to it, it's going to accept some input, which we'll just call data. 
So here we're feeding it the rows of the result of getting the database documents. And so the definition of the show tables is it's going to it's going to accept some data. The data in this case are the rows, the results of the rows. Before we go much further, let's just very briefly see if this if we're on the right track because what comes next is going to be more complicated. We'll just say a quick console log. May not be exactly what I want to see, but we'll just say data. Show me in the console log some data. Let's see. Let's save and run this. Hopefully, we don't have any problems at the moment. Let's stop and to see we're all on the right track because what comes next is we're going to build a row, a, a table row by row, and it's going to get a little confusing. Let's see what mine looks like first, and then uh, we'll stop to take questions. So you should just be able to click show classes, console, dbler, all that. Oops, I didn't copy the, um, misspell this, sorry. All docs, capital D. So if you did it exactly like me, I apologize. Go back to line 40, capital D, all docs. That's why I stopped to test it. close enough. So if you save it and run it, hopefully you don't get any errors. If you get an error, try to see what line number it's telling you that you got the error. Remember Google uh, Chrome will, if you have an error, it will may or may not be helpful, but then it'll tell you what line number. Pay attention at the end right there. It's telling me line number 4, 40. So I can see my error, but if you can't, it's telling me line 40. So just to confirm, that's all docs, capital D. And what I'm doing is I don't have to add anything to the document, uh, to the database. I'm just going to click show me the, the records. I'm going to click show classes. Nothing happens on screen yet. I haven't gotten that far. But in the console, at least it's saying you've got this object and this object and this object. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven classes so far. And I can confirm that over on resources. I can look at by sequence, and I've got seven classes so far. And I can go pretty deep in there. Yeah, so that'll work so far. That's what I want to see so far, just to confirm then. Do you see something like this? Does anyone need some help? Let me pull my code up right here. Let's see. One thing, um, no space. For the moment, just click show classes. We've already got data in the database. Right, so show classes, that's what we call show classes. So double click on the one point there. Show classes, double click it just to select it and copy it. Scroll down. That's where we're at right now because we've got show table class. Double click that to select it, okay. and 
all you need is whatever. Right? There was this function, show table of classes data, blah, blah, blah. Just do that, and then why not try? Do it right after your class in the Just write those three lines on the bottom. So you just can't change your classes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not yes. All right, so what we will do is we've got this data, we're, we've pulled it out using the show classes function, and I can kind of confirm that in that console log output, but I actually want to show it on screen in a nice way. So we're going to create a table, just like I've got this sticker sheet here that I give everyone. This is a table. This has got, um, you know, columns and rows. This is the column of student names, student ID, access code, etc. So I'm going to build this in HTML. So a table will work great because that's what a table in HTML is for, to display data like this. So we're going to take each row that we're pulling out of the database and show it on screen. And then the next one, and then the next one, and the next one, for as many, for as many rows that we have. So after console log, um, we're going to create a new variable which we'll call div. It's not the div tag, it's a variable called div, but we will what we will do is put a shortcut to that div on screen of results. So document dot get element by ID, which element? The one called the result. Semicolon. So we're putting a shortcut there, a shortcut reference. Instead of redoing this over and over, document.getElementById, we, we put that basically into the div so we can quickly um, reference it. Next line, we'll create another variable. We'll call it str for string. We're going to put a string together. Line by line, we're going to build a table. And each of those lines of code is going to go into this one variable, string, str. And we'll start it off like this. Well, just to be safe also, I'm going to close the semicolon there because we're going to lose track of it. So we'll close the semicolon, and then we'll start in quotes the table tag, only the opening table tag. Table tag does have an opening and a closing. So think about this. There's a start table tag here, and there's a close table tag here. So we're going to build the first row, and then populate it in the middle, and then close it. So this will be cool. We're starting the table, and this is the whole table. We've got our very first row, which is a special row. This, this first row will have these headings. So what comes next is we've got... Oops. We've got... Uh, tr tag. We're defining the first table row. We're starting a table. We're not going to end it yet. We're defining our first row, and actually that one we will then close slash tr. So this is going to look different than before when we've written any, any HTML, because technically we're writing it inside of a string but once we finish building this and actually show it on screen, it'll render properly. So here we're defining our first row. In the first row, we have a th tag and its pair. Table heading. Like I've got a heading here, student name. In our case, that's going to say CRN in the tag. So CRN is our first heading. It's in this row, part of the table. We need a second heading. So after this TH pair, another TH pair, another table heading, 
and that one is class. So we've built the second heading, class. We've got the first heading of CRN, the second heading of class. What's our third heading? What's the third instructor? So we need another TH pair. instructor. This creates the very first row of the table. This line does end with a semicolon. We're not quite done yet. So next line, this time we'll say st string, str, just by itself, not with the var. We are not recreating the string or reinitializing it. We're, we're using it again, string. And then we're going to do, I think I might have mentioned this very briefly a long time ago, but now it's very important. Now we're going to write plus equals. We're going to add to what's already in the variable. Whenever we simply have equals, it replaces what's in the variable with something new. So whenever we've got something equals something, throw out what's already inside of that variable and replace it with something new. But with plus equals, it's leave what's already in the variable and add something else to it at the end. So if that's the top of our table, the ending of our table is, is necessary. So semicolon there, quotes slash table. The table starts here. We still need stuff in the middle, and the table ends. This is enough for the moment to see if we're on the right track. Next line. Well, this doesn't actually display it on screen. This is displaying it on screen. Div dot inner HTML equals str. Instead of re having to rewrite document get element by id the result dot inner HTML equals string, we just said div because we have a shortcut to that right here. We made the variable div, we filled it with that reference to that div, and then we just use the shorthand div dot inner HTML equals string, whatever we filled it in with right there. At this point, if you save it and run it and click Show Classes, it still won't quite work, but at least you'll have a very basic table, hopefully, with, the, with those three headings. Oh, okay, let's see what mine looks like. Um, let's see, refresh that, Show Classes, there we go. Getting there, kind of. CRN, class instructor. So it still works to click to highlight. If you click on TH, it should show you its pair. So there's the pair for CRN, there's the pair for classes, and there's the pair for instructor. And don't forget the pair for TR, TR. And then the table, and then we close the table. So that's what we've got so far. It's not pretty yet, but we're getting there. It's actually so unpretty, it's kind of annoying. I actually, doesn't a table have borders and such? Doesn't it have edges and stuff so I can tell where the edge of the table is? Let's add that so we can actually see the edges of the table. That's going to be a property of the table. So within, within the table tag, back up to the table tag there, line uh, 50, in the table tag, add a space and we'll write border equals single quote, single quote, one. Normally we're always using double quotes, but we don't want to use a double quote here. Because if I do double quote, double quote, string equals quote, end quote, gibberish, start quote, end quote. So to get away from that, remember we had to do this previously, we put the single quotes inside of the double quotes for that to work. If we do double quotes in the double quotes, it's not going to work. It's going to break 
your quote at the moment it reaches the other kind of quote, or the same kind of quote. So we use the other kinds of quotes right there to avoid that. Now if you save it and run it, show classes, now you get a simple border around your table and you can kind of see the edges. Alright, so if it is working, it looks something like this. Show classes. There we go. There's a, there's a table being born. I've got these borders, and of course I need to deal with alignments and all of that stuff later. But I'm seeing at least one row of my table. Now it's time to get all of those documents that I've got in the database and show them on screen, one at a time. In this case, we're going to use a loop. We haven't done this before. We're going to loop through all of the data, so all of the data that is coming into this function, this data that's coming in is row by row of information, we're going to loop through that data and display it on screen, a row at a time. So we're going to write an algorithm for a loop. Once we write this algorithm, it'll just loop on its own, following our, cri our criteria, and therefore it can display three classes, 30 classes, 300 classes. We're going to do this between the start of the table and the end of the table. So actually give yourself a new line 51. This is the end of the table, but there's nothing in the table. So give yourself a new line between the start and the end of the table. And here we're going to create a loop known as a for loop, F-O-R. This is one of the many kinds of loops that we can work with, but for our purposes it should work just fine for, open close parentheses, open close curly brace, semicolon. The way a for loop works is basically for a number of uh, for a number of objects do something. Um, so within the, the 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 parentheses we define the parameters of our for loop. So inside the for, we will create a variable. We can create a variable right there, and we can call it anything we want, but standard is that it's called i for index equals zero. So it's going to start with the zeroth item in the database. Computers count from zero, not from one. So most of the time, we're going to be starting with the zeroth item, which in our human parlance is the first item. The first item, the first index in this database is zero, not one. And then very uncommon at this point, semicolon. And we're adding another parameter here, i, less than. So it's just one left ankle bracket. And we are then using it here as an actual less than. Um, next to that, we're then we're saying... Uh, data dot length. What that means is we've got a bunch of data that we're working with. As long as i is less than the maximum number of items we've got in this object, we're good. So we're starting with zero, the first item. And we might have 12 items in the database, so it, it, would, it would actually be position 11, because we start from 0. 
So as long as i is less than 11. Right now I've got seven items in my database. So as long as i is less than 6, because we start from 0. Semicolon, and then i++. plus plus. So what's happening here is we start off with i and we set it to 0. And then we check, is 0 less than 6? Because I've got seven items in my database. So tell me, true or false, is 0 less than 6? True, 0 is less than 6. So then it would do everything that we're going to tell it inside these parentheses, uh, these curly braces. And then it would increment i by 1. Something plus plus means just add 1 to it. So 0 plus 1. So now we loop back again, and now it's 1 less than 6. Is 1 less than 6? True. So we do it again, whatever we're going to say in here. Then we increment it. 1 plus 1, 2. Then it does it again. Is 2 less than 6? Yes. Do it again. Add one more. 3. You get, you get up to that point. 5 plus plus 6. Is 6 less than 6? No. 6 is equal to 6. Therefore, we get no, so we break out of the loop, and we're done. So if we had 600 objects in the database, it would go i less than 599 over and over and over and over and over until it gets to uh, 598 is less than 599? Yes. 599 is less than 599? No. Done. That's our algorithm. We're stepping through each object in the database just by this property of dot length. It's just the reserved keyword that is the number of how many items there are in the, in, in the database in this case. And then what this will do is it will add more to the string to actually display it on screen. So we'll say str space plus equals. And this is in the curly braces now. This is what we're going to do over and over and over. The other things only happen once, technically. And then this is going to loop over and over and over as many times as we have items in the database, the length of the database. And what we will do is add one more, one more row to the um, to the database. So first we'll start off with quotes. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll end the semicolon there also. Quotes. We're building our first row, which is the tr tag, but we don't close it yet. And we're also starting td tag. td is a table data. On this sticker sheet, the very first row is a special one. It's got headings, ths. But the next table row, tr, is made out of plain old tds, table datas. So each one of these cells is a td. Only the first row has ths. Table heading, table heading, table heading, th, th, th. And then everything else in between here is td, 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 td. All of these are basic cells. So we're making our first, we're making a, a new row and a new cell. After the quote, but before the semicolon, plus space. Well, now we're saying data. Square brackets. We haven't seen those before square brackets. In the square bracket we add an i, I'll explain why in a moment, dot result dot underscore id. Back on the other function where we were pulling out every record of the database, we then said that the data is being kind of temporarily stored in result. So now we're using it here. Specifically, the ID of the first result. Because here, we're saying data brackets i. We start off with here. We, we defined i as 0. So 0 passes in here data zero, the zero with item, the first class. So data, imagine this is saying data zero, the very first class. Give me its ID. And I'm still building this, this table. 
but give me that ID and show it in this row. When it's done with this, then it'll increment i to 1. So it'll come back to the loop, and it'll say data 1. Show me the second item, the, the index item number 1. Show me its next ID. i will increment to 2. So then it'll come back here, data 2. Show me the third item, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? We're going to continue here, actually, because we, we need to display the ID. We need to display the um, class title, and we need to display the instructor. So we need to also continue to display here. After the ID, we'll do plus. And actually, I'm going to break this into a new line down here, because it's just going to go on pretty far. But uh, don't forget that plus before you press enter. And we're going to say, um, quotes, we can uh, slash td because I, sh I finished that one cell. This cell, td slash td, includes the ID of the data, of the result. Um, and then I need to uh, start to build the next uh, cell. So that's opening a TD tag again. After the quotes, before the semicolon, another plus. We'll kind of do the same thing from right above there. Data brackets i dot result dot title. So data would define the whole database, but then data i defines one record, one document in the database, specifically that particular result with that particular title, that particular ID. And if you recall, this goes way back to when we defined it. Title comes from way up here, a class. This class has ID, has title, has inst. So that's what I'm saying. Show me its title. Show me its ID, and next show me its inst in this database, uh, in this table. So continuing, space plus. This right here, doc? In my documentation, I do say doc, but I'm showing that it can be anything we want because I didn't use doc up here if I had called that doc if I had called that doc then I would reuse doc lower down so I am changing it a little bit from my documentation uh, from my example but the, the concept should still hold anything that I call this because I also called it result here I'm continuing to use it down here Um, next line, same as before, quotes, we need to end that TD and start a new TD. And then again, data brackets i dot result dot inst. So now I've got the final cell, the instructor, space plus, enter, and then we'll finally close up the um, slash td, right, that goes back to close this, this, this one cell, and then we have to remember to close the row. We started the row up here, so we'll close the row. slash tr. So here we've then added a brand new row into the table. We've got the opening and closing of the table, and then we've added one row, the, the zero with item. If we had one item in the database, it would then show one result. Well, I've got seven classes that I, that I put in the database. 
So then it'll increment from i0 to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 is less than 6. Done. You break out, finish the table. You've got a screen full of classes. Hopefully. Let's see how mine looks like. I'm going to refresh that. I'm going to click Show Classes. And I get an error. Cannot write property of undefined. Hmm. What line? Right there next to results you got underscore ID and where's the other one so you can type. So you need to change that underscore ID to CR. No, because notice we, we call the other one title and inst, but here we've got underscore ID. Oh, okay. Now maybe maybe I did make a little mistake here. Okay, I am gonna put it over to doc just in case. Um shouldn't matter because those are results. Okay, so let me just try that very fast. I do have in my example calling this thing doc, but it should not matter. Let's see if it does. Did it work for anyone? Hmm. Well, I thought it didn't need to be arbitrarily that, but I guess it does. Um, so here's the fix. Way back on line 41, we have error, comma, result. Maybe result is reserved. So maybe if we call it cat, it will work. But on line 41, <coughs> there's result. Double click it just so that it highlights result result.rows, and then down here, result.id, result.title, result.inst. I changed that to doc, D-O-C, which is my example that I put in the, in the uh, network folder. So I changed those five instances of result to doc, and it seemed to have worked. So it is called doc internally. Okay, my mistake then. So, um, oh, okay. Uh, okay, just the last three here. Doc. So instead of this result, we'll just do doc. Show classes. There we go. So okay. Um, so up here, that's results. That's result. Um, I suppose if we change them to all be called doc, then it kind of might might make more sense. So we've got here is the object itself has a reserved word called doc. Uh, kind of like how we did up here. error, there's message, that's reserved, that's built into the error message, so that's why I'm calling it message. So then, uh, then we would observe that the data that we're pulling from the database has the reserved doc, and then the particular object, and the data of the object. So I'll try that. How many after making that change then did it work? A few people. Okay. Great. So we're definitely on our way, once again, to check the result. Um, if I add another class, let's say this is class uh, 1A55, class title, um, Japanese instructor Miyazaki, add class. It still has the functionality that it's simply said add, added class. Okay, I then I have to press show classes. And then there we have the newest one, 1855. 
So there's still some functionality that I want to add to this. It's kind of clunky, isn't it, that I have to press show classes. I would like it to show up automatically. We can do that relatively easy. And then, of course, I want to do the functionality of, well, I want to maybe update this stuff or delete it, change it or delete it. We'll do that also. Um, we're building to that, so let's um, let's fit in one more little thing, um, which is okay. Um, well, we'll do it like we'll do this instead of it. Uh, Instead of us having to uh, sh show the classes all the time, I want it to update my table right away. I want it to, as soon as I add a new class, automatically update itself. There's a built-in method of um, PouchDB, which if it detects any changes, something will happen. So I want that if I, change, if I add something to the database, it'll detect it, and then it'll update itself on screen automatically. So let's go back to the code, and this, um, I want this uh, to kind of happen as soon as possible if there's any changes. So actually, I'm going to add this to, to the beginning of the document, even before add classes. So we're going to back up up to line 9. Give yourself a new line... 10. Um, push, separate the add classes and the creation of the database. So I want this kind of to happen as soon as possible. If there's any changes, update the um, the the table. So then we'll say db dot info. We're going to retrieve some info about the database. And then after that, do a result. Semicolon. So we're going to check some info. For example, were there changes? If there were changes, then display the display the um, the, the changes, the update. Okay, wait a minute. This one's a little confusing. The it happens actually. Let me let's back up. Let's delete that. And let's start again. db.info. This has opening close parentheses here and close semicolon there. And then we'll break the parentheses right there. So simply checking for info then results in our possible callback functions of error or, or information. So we'll say function callback Uh, open close parentheses, open curly brace, close curly brace. And then I'll push that curly brace to the next line. I'm checking information about the the database. And there's, if there's a result, there's a callback, and inside of the callback, there's either an error, we'll call it error again, comma, this time we'll call it info. This could be result again if we wanted. Um, 
Yeah, we'll see. We'll, we'll keep it all consistent result. So there's either an error or a result. Inside the curly braces there, db.changes, open close parentheses, dot on open close parentheses semicolon. So here we're sort of doing like the, um, we don't have the example here, but we have a uh, add event listener. Remember in the Android project, we have check if Cordova's ready. We're waiting for that event. Here we're waiting for an event in a sense as well. Uh, a particular event that happens on this database. Uh, the one that we're waiting for in the in the parentheses in quotes is change. There's a reserved event built into PouchDB called change. There's other ones also. But if something changes in this database, uh, run a function. So after comma, after quote, comma, and then we've got the show classes function. And the syntax is we do not add the parentheses here. This is a function, the show classes function that we created down there. In this case, we're not adding the parentheses. Um, the syntax of it is that we've got this callback function. We don't add the parentheses, or else it would be executed immediately. We want to wait until the change happens. So that is the show classes function from down here, but without the parentheses. We have some other options that we actually want to use with changes. So I wrote it all as one line, but actually then I'm going to break it so I can read this a little bit more. I'm going to break it within the uh, parentheses right here of changes. So enter a couple of times to break it. Or actually before I break it, yeah, before I break it I'll do this. Open, close, uh, curly braces. And then I'll break within the curly braces, like that. Because that's similar to one of these other things that I did remember, that we've got um, right here, all docs. We've got the opening curly brace, comma, and then that callback. So we're doing something very similar in that we're going to give it a couple of parameters or options at the same time in the curly braces. So back here under changes, We'll write since colon result dot update underscore seq. That's a reserved pouch db thing. We're checking um, uh, when has the since when are we checking for changes when there's been an update to in the sequence of the PouchDB data. Next line, live true. We're saying keep keep checking on this, keep this live, keep, um, uh, keep it uh, active, let us keep checking as soon as any changes happen. If there is a change in the way we define here, then just immediately update the screen, the table. Let's uh, let's see if that worked. Let's add. Uh, let's load it up in the browser. Add a brand new class, and hopefully it should automatically display without having to click show classes. So my 
added the class, it automatically updated. I'm going to add another class. Zero, 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 zero. This is our binary class. I'm going to click add a class. Right away it updated itself. I didn't have to click show classes because that db.changes is hanging out, it's live, it's waiting for a change. Once the change happens, it runs the function show classes for me. Now I do have to, when I first load it up, I would have to click show classes. No changes have happened, so if I want to see the classes the first time, I can click show classes and it shows the classes. And now subsequently when I make any changes, then add the class updates. That's that code there. Basically, uh, I think this is a good stopping point. Basically, there's one more little thing. But um, basically, at this point, we've got uh, uh, part of the functionality. We can add to the database. We can retrieve from the database. We're still missing update the database, delete stuff from the database. But everything that we've been talking about so far has come from the example that I put in the in the folder. Remember back in the network folder we've got pouch db example. Um, that has one thing that we didn't quite get to right now, delete classes. You can start to look at that if you want. We'll do it together next time. And also notice that one's using couch or pouch 3.3.1 and we're using the latest one, 4.1. And then also if you want to also explore on your own, I've got that link of tutorials. You can start to look at this stuff here. Basically what we are creating right now is a variation on this YouTube video on using pouch DB. And then there's other things here that we'll need to work with such as uh, or deal with such as pouch DB and phone gap aka Cordova. And then of course people talking about it on uh, Stack Overflow and other examples if you want to get more advanced, um, building an app and all of that. So more stuff to keep you entertained. Uh, in the short term, we're going to end uh, the lecture at the moment. Check the code there if you want. And when we come back, we're going to add the functionality to delete from the database, update records in the database, and maybe make it not maybe make it look not so ugly. Right now. These, these black and white rows of data is, is kind of hard to read. We're going to do something called zebra striping, where one row will be one color, alternating with another color, alternating with the first color, and that's much more readable. This kind of gets hard on the eyes. So simply alternating rows of colors will make it easier to read, and that's zebra striping with CSS. This is what we've got so far, and if you've got it working this far, great. When we come back, we'll wrap it up. We'll add it to the project, and it needs some special circumstances to add it to the project, which actually, I forgot to put it in the folder, but I'll put it in the folder just to give yourself a preview. And then we'll continue with our project. We'll do some lab time, and then when we come back, we'll continue.